Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the January 17th meeting of the San Dimas Rotary. My name is Steve Scott. I'm the president of the Rot Rotary. I have been a member now for about 14 years. Uh, this is my fourth term as president. I'll be starting my fifth one in July. Um, very excited to be here today. Um, also, I am a State Farm agent in the city of San Dimas. Uh, let's go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves. Raymond Foster, how are you, sir? I'm great, Steve. Uh, Raymond Foster, I'm the Zoom master, current secretary, and immediate past president. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Raymond. Wayne, how are you? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Wayne Schmidt, and I'm a member of the uh, Rot Rotary Military Families, and I'm very happy to be here. We're happy you're here. Ray Kearney, it is great to see you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you doing, Steve? Fantastic. Um, yes, I'm a member of the Azusa Rotary Club and assistant governor for Group 5, which includes Azusa, Glendora, Laverne, and San Dimas. And I'm glad to be with you guys today. Well, thanks so much for taking time to be here. We appreciate it. Sure. Um, Margarita, how's everything going? Good. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Margarita McGee. I'm a local attorney, Rotarian, uh, and a bunch of other things here in San Diego. <laughs> Involved in everything. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for being here, Margarita. Glenn, how's everything today, sir? Doing well, doing well. My name is Glenn Johnson. I'm a member of the Satellite Rotary Club of Military Family Support and the Sandium's Masonic Lodge. Thanks for being here, Glenn. Uh, Sandra, how are you today? I'm doing great, thank you. Very happy to be here and looking forward to the presentation. Um, I am involved with the Ambassador Committee. I chair the, the Chamber Ambassador Committee. Um, I um, am also on the Board of Directors of the Chamber of Commerce, and I hold a seat on the Senior Commission. So very um, anxious to be here today and, and learn about um, the topic at hand. We're excited you're here. And Marilyn, how's everything going as a fellow insurance professional? I know it's an interesting time for us. <laughs> oh, you're muted. <laughs> but I love it, Steve. So, uh, yes, my name is Marilyn Sparks. I'm a local farmer's insurance agent. I'm also a notary. I sit, um, I'm a Sandy Miss Anglandora Chamber board member, or not board member, but member. I sit on the board of directors for McKinley, and I also serve as a Los Angeles County Insurance Commissioner. Thank you so much for being here, Marilyn. And Mary Ann Kissler, how are you today? Hmm. Mary Ann, you're being on mute. It's the one time we caught Mary Ann quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mary Ann Kissler. I am the current foundation chair. I've been in Rotary over 30 years, and I really, really like what Rotary does. Well, we are happy that you're here. Uh, you. If we get any other Rotarians joining the, the call as we move, we will give them an opportunity to in, uh, introduce themselves after our speaker, who, as I mentioned, Kevin, before you got on the call, um, reading your, bar, your bio was, while incredibly impressive, also a tad depressing because I'm wondering what I've done with my 52 years of life. <laughs> um so let's start with his bio. Dr. Kevin O'Leary is a research fellow at the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of California, Irvine. A contributor to the American Prospect, he was the lead West Coast reporter for Time, as well as a reporter for the Los Angeles Times. He earned his PhD at Yale University. His previous book, Saving Democracy, A Plan for Real Representation in America, was a finalist for the American Political Science Association's Michael Harrington Award. With a focus on American politics and political theory, Kevin also teaches at Chapman University. As a journalist, he was a national correspondent for campaigns and elections, editorial page ed editor of the Pasadena Star News, and editor of OC Metro Magazine. A Phi Beta Kappa graduate of UCLA, he led the Washington inter Internship Program and was an intern to Speaker Tip O'Neill. He was a Coro Fellow in, in Los Angeles before attending Yale Graduate School. He lives in Irvine, California with his wife and two grown daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin O'Leary. 
Well, thank you very much, Steve. That was much more of a, <laughs> of a bio that we needed to do. That's fine. Basically, I'm, I've spent my career as a journalist um, and as a professor. Um, and so I've been following politics for a long time. And I do want to give a shout out to, to Raymond. Thanks for setting this up and being the contact with me. Appreciate that. And you've got a great group. Um, I've been giving talks to Rotary Clubs around Orange County and a little bit beyond for mm, probably since uh, August, September. And I really enjoy meeting people at the Rotaries and you guys do great stuff. Um, so I grew up, you know, a local kid. I was a commuter kid to UCLA, ended up getting these, you know, I figured the system out somehow class wise and had these good grades and decided, gee, do I want to go to law school? No, maybe somebody, one of my profs suggested poli sci. So I applied and end up getting, oh my God, I get into Yale and I go there and have these great professors and I go off afterwards and I'm doing kind of American politics and journalism. But one of my professors at Yale was a guy named Juan Lentz. And the reason I'm giving these talks is because of what Lentz, Juan Lentz's work and what he taught me. And Juan grew up in Spain, but not at a good time. He grew up during the Spanish Revolution, Spanish Civil War of the late 30s. It was a precursor to World War II. Um, and it was just nasty. And afterward, Franco was a dictator. Uh, they, had, they had an embryonic democracy before, but it collapsed. And Lentz, you know, was greatly affected by that. And he made it his life's work to try to figure out why democracies get into trouble and what are the patterns you have to watch out for? Um, and so he studied, you know, Europe and Latin America. Um, and I go off with my career and I'm you know, teaching and being a journalist. And then lo and behold, about 10 years ago, some of the patterns that Juan Lentz spoke about started to show up in America. And I said, oh, this is, this is not good. Um, and so um, for my talk, I'm going to have three topics, basically. One is our values. The second is a bit of history. And a third um, is kind of like what to watch out for. So I'm being nonpartisan giving this talk. Everybody has their own political views. You guys you know, are a wonderful community organization. Um, and, you know, and, and there's enough of the you know, cable news and in your face stuff and politics has gotten kind of rancorous, right? Um, so my talk's meant to kind of give us a little bit of a perspective and kind of step back just a little bit to kind of understand stuff. And let me start with our values, because it's really interesting to me that the Rotary Clubs have these four values, the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair? Will it build goodwill? Will it be beneficial to all? And what I want to suggest is in the post-war era, and most of us are old enough to remember the Cold War, that whole period from 45 to what, 89, was dominated by the competition with the Soviet Union. Um, and that affected how we thought about democracy. We, we, we decided kind of academics and journalists that democracy was a process. And we didn't talk about values, I think, enough. And it was convenient to say, okay, everybody has the right to vote. Everybody can run for office. We have all these freedoms and you can specify them, right? The right to association, et cetera. Um, free and fair elections, the whole thing. All right, and that's all well and good, but there's another side to democracy that groups like yours, civic organizations like yours express. And that's this kind of sense of democratic values that a community shares. And when people get community they're expressing that and that democracy so you know if you think about the values we share honesty decency neighborliness hard work assisting those in need those values are every bit as important and essential in what democracy is as elections or jury duty or whatever okay um and a really famous writer you've heard this guy Alexis de Tocqueville, he came and wrote the, the best book ever on American politics called Democracy um, in America. It is way, way back in the time of um, Andrew Jackson, it's the 1830s. 
it's about what 50 years after the revolution a little bit more and in that book was wandering around the u.s he's supposed to be here studying the prison system but he's really trying to figure out why democracy works in america when it doesn't seem to be working that well in europe after the french revolution and lo and behold what does he find he finds out that it's not the institutions which are great it's not you know a society based on law that's great but he says underneath that is what's critical and those are norms what what the french would call mores and he said the norms are what hold us together because that comes first that underlays everything else so if we believe in democracy and we practice these values that you get in the boy scouts or you know whatever religion you are whether it's a, a christian synagogue muslim whatever you know the face kind of build up these values as well of thinking about others and trying to do the right thing that's what helps us because one thing that tocqueville said that was very interesting too was he talked to, that we're a very individualistic community in america right people go off and do their own things they move around the country all this kind of stuff but he said in america it's kind of like the americans understand um how to do that that they have a a um a, self-interest um, properly understood was the way he expressed it. And by that, he meant, you know, if you're a farmer and you're going about raising your crops or whatever, you're a small business person, if something happens down the block or to another farm, you're willing to help out usually, right? And Americans are very good about helping out. Look at how we respond to natural disasters, right? People, people pitch in. And he thought that was really good. So he said, we're not, you know, we're focused on ourselves and our families, but for democracy to work and the way it works in America, we think about others as well and what's good, good, good for the whole. A second thing on values is they come out of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment allowed us, well, it told us, <laughs> it, it expressed what was true, that most people who are adults have good thinking apparatuses. You know, some people go off and get PhDs and stuff like that, but everybody has common sense. And they go about their careers and their work, and, and they, they can they can make judgments. And what this guy, you know, the famous philosopher John Locke, who was English, who kind of set up the American Revolution in a way, in his philosophy, which was groundbreaking, just like Rousseau and these others, he said that, and this is radical at the time, he said that a peasant, right, all those people in the fields, they could think just as well as the aristocrats and the king. And at the time, that was a radical notion. That was as revolutionary as you could get. And 100 years after he wrote that, the French Revolution happened. And, and just before that, the American. And the Americans took that to heart and said, we can set up a middle class society with just everybody can participate, right? Once, once you're an adult, you're a citizen and you're no longer a subject. Right. Being a subject is not a good thing. And that's the basic choice. So I'll switch here to kind of second topic is um, a, a little bit of history. Democracy, we all accept and we grow up in an American democracy they're very proud of. But most of us don't know. Um, it's kind of shocking that democracy is relatively rare in the human experience. Um, the Greeks yeah. invented it. You had the Roman Republic, and then you get the Dark Ages. You get a little bit of flicker with Florence and the Italian Renaissance. And then there's the English Revolution about 100 years before ours. And it's only partially successful in its radical desires or implications or goals. But those goals, the outcome of the English Revolution, it's like 1640 to 1660. It's the one time they never, they don't, they execute a king. They don't have a king for like 11 years. Um, the outcome of that politically was that the parliament grew in strength versus the king. But in addition, the nature of that revolution brought out ideas like the right to vote, the idea of political equality the importance of free speech. And those ideas ended up migrating to America when the colonists were here, right? From the pilgrims on. 
And we kind of ran America before the revolution as a bunch of New England town hall meetings. And so we were practicing democracy on the ground, even though we had, you know, governors appointed by the king. So, so the history is that, you know, democracy is relatively rare. We invented representative democracy right here in America. They didn't, they, before it was always thought you have to have direct democracy. Think of San Dimas or any small town in, in the metropolitan area, right? You can have people come to city council meetings and so forth, and you do direct democracy. Um, but Madison challenged all the experts before and said, no, 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 we can do this on a bigger scale. We can have representative democracy and send representatives to Sacramento or D.C., and, and we've made it work, right? Um, okay. So the other choice is, and I mentioned this about kind of citizen being a citizen versus being a subject, um, is that the other basic choice, it's got lots of names, is autocracy. So that's the rule of one or a small group or maybe oligarchy. And, you know, either a single individual or a small group running things. And we've, we've sworn that off. We said, we're not going to do that. But in human history, that is the usual way societies are governed, you know, and, and people in those societies aren't necessarily happy. Some of them want to rebel, but it's hard to do. And most of them accept it. And, and so we've had ebbs and flows with democracy. In the 1930s, when fascism was rising in Europe with, with Hitler and Mussolini, we were down to like a dozen democracies around the world. Um, in the 80s and 90s, democracy is doing really well, and most countries are democracies. And now, even countries that are not democratic, certainly Putin's Russia, they want to claim that they have elections. Well, we know that they're not fair, right? You know, um, so kind of like that, that's where we are. And, the, and the, a key thing here, too, is that you think of, Governments being overthrown, um, but usually when democracies get in trouble, it's more kind of like democratic decay, and and norms get challenged, and and change happens gradually, and people don't quite realize it, and and it's sneaky in the sense that if it's an extremist from one side of the perspective, far left, the far left folks, the Marxist Leninists. They, they tell you they don't like democracy and they want communist party rule. The autocrats, the dictate, would-be dictators, um, they in the 20th century usually pretend to be Democrats because they know that's popular and they practice their skills with speaking and so forth and they don't express it. So that, get this, um, Hitler, Hitler ran for office. He, he was... Now, he never got 50%, but he played the game until there was a loophole in the German constitution and people were, were so divided and, and he was pressuring them and his people, the Nazi party was strong that the powers that be gave him the chancellorship, which was like this really big power. And then he took over over the next six months, but he, he it wasn't a violent overthrow. Um so you kind of have to watch out that watch out for politicians who are kind of strangling democracy while pretending to engage in it. Now, one other thing on history is that revolutions are rare, but revolutions happen. One thing that's distinctive about the American experience is we not only had the American Revolution, but that we were smart enough to put together the Constitution. And I say this, I'll give you a current example. About a dozen years ago or more, right, there was the Arab Spring, and you had the uprising in Cairo. Well, they did a really good job, and they worked a long time. It was underground. I've read about this. It was it was not just like they went to the square and this happened. People did a lot of spade work beforehand. And they were able to overthrow Mubarak. But, but, but the folks that led that charge weren't ready to deal with the people that would be opposed to having a democracy, even though the people that led the revolution wanted democracy, you still had the armed forces, 
Um, the peasant class was conservative and there were too many, you know, the radical Islamists. And basically the army took over later, right? So you, you didn't solidify. So they didn't think through, we've, we've got to have a constitutional system. So Madison and Hamilton and the rest, they did that, you know, and it's a, it's a dozen years after the revolution, 1776 to 1787. And they, they put in place this, this really wonderful constitution with the checks and balances, all the rest. Now, historically, my last point here is to say, is the constitution perfect? No. <laughs> and political scientists and historians look at it and they know because it was the first on the block, so to speak, if we had done the constitution 30 or 50 years later, we wouldn't have the electoral college, right? we wouldn't have some things that we have in the system. Uh, a really important one, small detail, really important. James Madison did not want every state to have two senators. He wanted to have the Senate set up similar to the House of Representatives so that population would give more clout to the states who were larger. But to get the Constitution done, they had to make compromises. Okay, so America is, you know, extraordinary in this way. Um, now I'm going to change to, you know, the turmoil I've been facing the last dozen years plus. It's disturbing and we're in the middle of it. But one way to look at it is that we've been here before and we've gotten through it. And a period that we don't think about very much you know, you hear all this talk about civil war, but civil war, for good reasons, is not something people should say. Um, the Irish, one of the really good Irish writers right now, wrote a great essay in Atlantic. A guy's name is Fintan O'Toole, where he said, my dad came home at the beginning of the Troubles and said, there's going to be a civil war. And because people believe that, they got into the Troubles. But Fintan's point was, they never got to a civil war, but the Troubles were really bad. So you don't, he's like, don't start talking about something that's way out there. Um, so the point, the period I want to bring up quickly is from 1880 to 1920, long time ago, right? That was a period of tremendous change, much like today, right? Back then you went from a small town, rural society, farming economy to an urban industrial America, right? And in addition, you had a big wave of immigration from 1900 to 1920, right? And a lot of people were freaked out by that. Today, we've got, you know, for quite a while, we've had this global economy and global competition. You know, even if you're in small business, you have to think about that sometime. And we've had a surge of immigration, and it takes a while for people to get used to that. Now, California, our, our our state, we went through this kind of angst about immigration back with Prop 187. And we've become a very cosmopolitan. You look at the college campuses, you look at people from age 40 below, they're in America, in California, they're pretty accepting that there's going to be a lot of variety and different looks and ethnicities and backgrounds to people. And there's a lot of intermarriage. That's healthy. But there's a lot of the country that hasn't gone through that change yet and is just kind of freaked out. What I tell people that are freaked out about immigration is, and you have to have a border system, you have to have controls in the border, of course. But you look at the second generation of people that come, they always become Americanized, right? The second and third generation of people that come, they're, they're us, right? Their parents work super hard for them to be successful, and then they're Americans, and, and, and that's great. Okay, final theme is danger of extremism. If I ask you, and I will right now, why has American democracy lasted almost 250 years? What, what are some ideas on that? What would people say? Why is the system held together? Perception of freedom. Uh-huh, perception of freedom, what else? Anything institutionally? I think education, the education system 
puts a belief in the quote unquote democracy that we have, belief in the constitution, belief in how it was formed. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 And you could go on with kind of, you know, separation of powers, right? Um, checks and balances, uh, federal system, all kinds of stuff, right? But one I want you to think about in particular is America's, from a comparative perspective, when you're thinking about other countries, our politics have been more toward the center than most places. And we've usually had a center left party and a center right party. And we've never at the national level had real political extremes of the far right or the far left. Other countries, other people looking at us say, oh, American politics is kind of boring. You know, usually the parties are not that different. I mean, the people in politics and the people who are, who are part of interest groups trying to get things done. Yeah, they're they're saying, boy, we can't, we're, we're, we're so different than the people on the other side. But from this larger perspective, this macro view of politics worldwide, nah, we're, we're pretty close. And that helps. It helps Madisonian democracy work because we can compromise, because we have the same values. So what do we share when we're in this broad civic middle? We share the same devotion to the Constitution and the basic values of America. We pledge allegiance, right? The problem, you know, the far left... And the far right is they don't believe in democracy. Um, and when you get a far left, and by that, I mean, not, not people talking, throwing around the term of socialist this, socialist that. That's people who are really Marxist Leninists. When Lenin led the Russian Revolution, he added to Marx's theory. Marx was basically writing critiques of capitalism, and he didn't think much about what was going to happen after the revolution. Well, Lenin said, we have to have an intellectual vanguard leading the thing and that became the communist party and they were always more important than anybody and right <laughs> it's it's it, it became stalin became terrible from the right the far right um you've got people again who don't believe in democracy and who just want to get you know power dictators in latin america and other places um strongmen or a certain group wants to be the dominant caste in the society, right? Everybody else has got to be second class. Um, and you want to watch out for both those. And we've just never had either a far, far left or a far, far right at the national level. And we've been blessed because of that. So it'd be good if we could keep politics that way. Um, when I was a kid and in the Coral Foundation, I went to Sacramento and was watching the folks debate, the legislators debate. They were going, they were going at it about an education bill. Like they really disagreed. And then after the fact, after after things got done, I was like surprised, and my fellows, my, my colleagues were surprised too. All the politicians, they all went to the same bar and were, were friends. They went to Frank Fats and were throwing down beers, right? And they were like best friends. And that's what we still see when things really work well, think about Scalia, right? And Ginsburg, really mm -hmm. different judicial views, but really good friends. They respected each other, right? And that's when democracy works well. When, when, you, when you disagree, and you know people are going to disagree with you. Nobody, nobody thinks the same as you. Um, and, and you listen to them and you have a dialogue and then you work at a compromise politically, you know, if you're trying to come to some, some kind of extension. Um, so a couple of things to watch out for. You don't want to have, um, you want to have rules to democracy. If, if people start throwing rules out and saying, we just do Paul, if we want, it's not democracy. You have to have rules for chess. You have to have rules for, you know, football, tennis, whatever game you want to think. Well, democracy is a game that way too. You need rules for it to work. Um, right. So in anything goes, politics is a recipe for authoritarianism. A, a second thing I want to emphasize is watch rhetoric. If, if people stop talking about the other side, quote unquote, as rivals and start to, you know, designate the other side as the enemy, that's bad news. The leading Nazi philosopher was a guy named Schmidt and he wrote 
elegantly. He was he was a wonderful thinker, just just in, you know supporting evil. And he talked about politics should really be about friends and enemies, you know. And if you put the other folks as enemies and you defeat them, you can do whatever you want to them. It's it's not it's not a good situation. And we can think about history there. Another thing is this shift from every politician you know always standing up and saying, no, you can't do that when people threaten violence or have violence. When you add violence to the mix, that's not democracy. So we want to get back to Frank Fats, you know, and we can do that. The last thing I'll say is this. Because politics is disturbing, a lot of people as a normal reaction, want to withdraw. They don't want to listen. You know, one of my daughters, she's, she's she doesn't want to look at the news right now, right? That's it's like most of us, you know. What do I do? I'm a political scientist journalist. What do I read first in the newspaper now? I read the sports section first. Right? I didn't used to do that. That's what I do. And I'm I'm somebody who, who's knee deep in this stuff. So that's normal reaction, but that's here, let me put it this way. In most decades and most elections, a lot of people in the electorate can sit it out. You can be business or business, just say politics isn't my thing, and the system will go on, right? But there are certain decades, there are certain times when Americans have been asked to step up and make a big decision. When the Civil War happened, those that decade and just before that was a big decision time and people knew something big was going on and they had to make a decision in the 1930s with the great depression and that was a big change because before nobody thought the government should get involved with the economy but with people you know getting desperate and starvation around the corner and people digging in trash cans roosevelt tried whatever he could and people said yeah yeah, you, yes, like we want we want the government to help us out if we're, we're in an economic dive. And both parties accept that now. And so, so now is another time when things are a bit fraught and we need people to lean in and engage. And they don't have to follow everything that's out there because they'll go crazy, but they have to be engaged enough to know the basic patterns, right? And we want them to vote. We want this kind of, my last point would be, the press makes us think that it's a 50-50 country. It's not in the sense of the two parties aren't like that. And if we just think about it as Republicans versus Democrats, we, it's that's kind of a mistake. It's better to think of it this way, that a great majority of the nation and people in Southern California are part of a broad civic middle that's probably 80% plus. And we have our differences, right? But we understand how the system works. We're proud of it. We know we can work through things. Do we need to make reforms in the political system? Yeah, but you know, sometimes that comes together and we get things done. Back in the beginning of the 19th century, no, beginning of the 20th, um, California was run by the railroads. They controlled the state legislature, lock, stock and barrel. And so the progressives came up with this idea, let's have let's have ballot measures. And they bypassed the state legislature and they blew the old system up and they gave people direct power. Now, are there problems with the proposition system? Yeah, but it was an example of change. We also, during that time, made US senators directly elected because a lot of the state legislatures were corrupt at that time. And so they, they gave it to the states and now we're totally happy with that. So let me just close with this, a, a little quote from my favorite conservative writer, Edmund Burke, who wrote the classic book, Reflections on the Revolution in France. He's the father of, of traditional conservatism, and he's got a lot of wise things to say. For example, as a conservative, Burke did not hate government. He thought government was essential. He just wanted smart people to run it and for people not to try to change everything at once. He thought that was crazy. He had this wonderful quote. He said, all that is necessary for the forces of evil to win in the world is, is for enough good men to do nothing. So when things are fraught, you know, you have to kind of step up. And that's what we want to do. We want, to, we want people to um, 
vote and we want them to think about what's going on and be calm, but, you know, do the right thing and we'll be fine. So that's, thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions. Stephen, thank you. That was fascinating. I wish we had another couple hours to talk about this. Um, we'll, we will open it up to questions. I'm, I have one just right off the bat. Um, sure. You, I think, aptly in your introduction, describe politics as rancorous right now. Um, yeah. My question is, how big of an impact do you think two things have had on that? One, social media, sure. and two, when the idea that news became could become profitable um, how, how much of an impact do you think that had on it? I think both are major. <laughs> I mean, um, on, the, on the second one first, I think we made a major mistake in the 80s. Like this was the Reagan administration. They did away with the fairness doctrine because you didn't have like that. The fairness doctrine, you know, said if you're going to have a public license to be a, a public broadcaster, you had to present both sides you know, or multiple sides. You couldn't just do, you couldn't be like a propaganda channel. Um, and now you got a cable world and that can happen, you know? And and if, you, if you're following things without getting into stuff, you could look up, if you know something about the Dominion case, well, one of the cable networks got penalized a lot, like millions and millions of dollars for knowing what was true and saying what was false because... To answer your question, Steve, they were chasing they were chasing money, right? Mm -hmm. They did it. They did it for for, for profit, and um, you know the the libel situation allowed the Dominion case to to for that to happen. The second part, I do think social media, just the whole media landscape has changed, um, you know, and this it's it's just difficult. You know, we were still adjusting to figure that out and newspapers have been hammered because the advertising base that used to be the LMS is less than in the 1990s they were big and proud and now it's less than half that size i mean it's still a major paper really important and thank god but the paper the newspaper business and, and journalism just does not have the same secure financial model it used to be and that makes things really difficult and then you get a, a plethora of things on social media that you can't fact check them. That people accept mm -hmm. them as true. All that stuff. So I think you're thank right. you very much. Um, we have any other questions? I have a question. Yes. So you you really um, touched on something that makes me crazy. Um, I don't know what happened to a responsible reporting of the facts when it comes to news. To me, I feel like no matter where you look, what you're getting is uh, an opinion um, or an interpretation, but not the actual facts. What yeah. resources do yeah. you recommend to get the <laughs> facts? Where would I, what, what outlets would I recommend? Yes. Yeah. Um... Okay, so traditionally, newspapers of high quality, the LA Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they still do this. They have a separation between the opinion pages. Like I was an editorial page editor. That meant I talked to the publisher and, and he talked to the owner. And sometimes that would dictate how we took positions. The reporters were over the, they were separate. It was like there was an editorial wall that happens in high class journalism. Um, a lot of places that doesn't exist. So I do think, um, you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street, you know, Washington Post, you know, they're doing their best. Can do day to day reporters make mistakes? Yeah. Um, but there's these, it's an ethical, it's an ethical profession and you're taught you know, to be very careful about what you report. Um, so there's still some good outlets that are out there, right? Now you look at the cable stations, you know, in terms of that on TV, they're playing to an audience and they're giving kind of their spin. It's kind of like, think about the spin room after a political debate, people come out and they spin, right? So each of the cable stations is like, they're, a, they're like, you know, 
a continuous spin outlet, right? So you have to take it with a grain of salt and just kind of pull back and say, yeah, were they hyping it too much? I will say, you know, the truth matters. And we've been kind of pushed into this disinformation stage where people kind of throw up their hands and say, nothing is, there's no truth out there. That's, 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 that's part of the bad stuff going on to make everything seem like it's equally, you know, fraudulent. And that's just not true. So, so there are good outlets out there. There are, you know, there are quality facts. Um, I'll say this, um, this is a modern thing, but George Orwell saw it. George Orwell saw how governments and the media could kind of report wrongly. And so he stressed, you know, the truth really matters. And there's luckily there's a lot of people that still believe that, that, that try to try to get the truth out. So I'll, I'll leave it at there. Nice question, Sandra. Uh, anybody else have questions? I have a quick question. Um, given your extensive history, I mean, the the political world here in the United States and the unrest in the Middle East, I mean, do you do you believe that we're on you know, the break of something different? Are we entering a different era um, uh -huh. in regards to our politics and everything going on around the world? So that's a really good question. Thank you for that. I mean, you have as much vision on this as I do. I think we're still adjusting to kind of like a post-Cold War world. I mean, to people who are, you know, older, it's kind of like crazy that one of the parties is thinking of saying, well, we don't really need NATO, right? Right. And and um the North, you know, the Western European alliance. Um and so things have changed. Um, and are we at a breaking point? No, I don't. I mean, if you get a tidal wave from one, you know, you, you could, but it, it takes a while for this stuff to happen. It, it takes a while. Um, and so I wouldn't, you know, I think sometimes you can get so upset that you think, yeah, it's really happened. But usually... When things are difficult, you just have to fight through it. I was I, I was teaching Churchill last semester, you know, and and the British and Churchill they had to fight through stuff by themselves for a long time. It took Churchill a long time to convince people that Hitler was real, and then he was basically on his own. They almost lost the entire army at Dunkirk. They were fighting the war for a year and a half without the U.S. Roosevelt was trying to help, but he couldn't do that much. But somehow the British did. They held, they, they held, they held, right? They had some defeats, but they didn't give up. And you look at other periods in history where things are rough, you just can't give up. You just got to hang in there and hope for the best. I mean, I won't even go into the Middle East is so, you know, a difficult region always, right? To, to even go into that, um, um, so I don't know that it helps. I want to, I want to say one thing and I'll, I'll still open for another question or two. Um, Steve, when I've given these talks before and people can see if they're okay with this in person, um, I've, I've sent out a yellow pad and gotten people's names and their emails because what I like to do is to send, um, a survey monkey to people after the talk, like the next day or two, to get their reactions to the talk. And it's it's quick. It just takes a couple of minutes. You've got some basic questions. And that's useful for me uh, just to kind of see what you thought of the talk. So if that's okay, maybe you guys could do that too. Yeah, um, I'm sure between Raymond and I, we can coordinate getting all those email addresses to you. I don't okay. think that'll be a problem at all. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Marilyn, you have a question? I do. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights. Um, it seems that things have gotten very extreme and voting seems to be who we are rather than what we do. Huh. Do you see a pendulum swing? Say, Explain that a little bit more. 
you say who we are versus what we do. Can you explain a little bit more? She may have cut out. Um, okay, well, I'll try. Well, it's a, who we are. Yeah, I mean, it, hmm. there's a, sure, there's a bit of that. It's not, it's just not, it's not as, it seems like voting now is a little more consequential, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? And and then it's hard because it seems like every, every election is consequential. It's like, what's going on? And, you know, um, yeah, it, it's just the way it is right now. What what can what can you say? I mean, I, yeah. you guys got as many as many views that are valid as as I do on this. So I'm happy to hear somebody else. Thank well, you, Kevin. Again, thank you very much. I I will say just in closing, one of the things I miss most is actual friendly political disagreement. Um, I think you can learn from debate, um, but now if you are on a, an opposing side, it seems like both parties just kind of shut off and don't want to listen to each other and as you said earlier, almost become the enemy. And I think that's that's disappointing. And I hope that turns because we can learn from disagreements. Yeah. Uh, so thank I you again. That, I think that's really true. And we should keep, don't, we shouldn't be intimidated to think that everybody's, that anytime we bring up politics, it's going to turn nasty. And we can still tell tell people that start making it nasty. Like, no, we don't need to do that. That most of the country, you know, most, most people, of both parties, a majority of, eh, maybe it's not both parties, majorities, but a lot of people are reasonable and will talk. And you have to think a third of the population doesn't vote. So the angry minorities on both sides who are trying to shove their agendas forward, we don't want them to dictate politics, right? Mm -hmm. We want reasonable people like Steve, what you're talking about, to be able to talk about, you know, the problems we face and how we like to handle them and how we'd like to move ahead. Because that's that's what democracy is about, trying to make collective decisions that will benefit all of us. So I think you 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 uh you said that very well, Steve. Thanks. Thanks. Again, thank you for your time. Um we we ran over and it was well worth it. Uh we're gonna move on to the next portion of our meeting. Kevin, as I said, if you'd like to stick around, fantastic, but you are certainly not obligated to um raymond if it's okay with you since our fine master is not here i'm going to forego that and move on to the action 360. Okay. Yes, do. perfect uh okay so the 2026 committee is hosting a chamber mixer on january 18th at high point brewery anything you'd like to add to that raymond that's tomorrow night and so that's at high point from five to six the 2026 committee is the committee here led by this rotary club to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which I think dovetails quite nicely onto the talk we've just had. So that committee is having a mixer at the high point. Uh, come on, join the committee and uh, go to sandemus2026.com to get involved. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next up, teacher mini grants. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, for those of you who are newer, we give out mini grants to teachers in the area every year. We have selected four recipients this year. Uh, we will be uh, giving those grants to the recipi recipients at the school board meeting on February 7th at uh, 6 p.m. Um, I have notified all of the grant recipients. Only one of them has not responded yet. I will reach back out to her. Um, and then as we get closer to the day of the, the event, I'll reach back out and confirm everything. Raymond, we'll have the big checks that day, I would imagine. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, moving on. Feeding heroes. Feeding military heroes. We got that coming up on March 9th. So far, we've gotten 13 tons of food out to the food pantry on 29 Palms Marine Corps Base. For those of you who don't know, 22,000 active duty families, 213,000 National Guard reservists, and 1.2 million veterans receive federal food assistance. Uh, there are food pantries on most major military bases to service junior enlisted personnel families. So we are not only going to do 29 palms, but we've sent 13 tons. The goal is seven tons this this uh, March, and we're going to take one of them down to Pendleton and six out to um, uh, 29 palms. If we're successful in September, when we do it again, we will include Fort Irwin, and then this little community will be feeding three military major military bases, and I think that's awesome. So 
Mark your calendars March 9th. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, and thank finally, you. Uh, I didn't know about that. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Uh, finally, we have Rotary, Rotary Youth Leadership Academy. Uh, dates have been set, and I don't have them in front of me. Raymond, do you? I I looked at the link the other day, Steve. It's it's out, a little bit out in the future. We still have time. I'll send we stuff do. to you. To you, I guess it's going to be Casey. Uh, both Casey's last both and Casey's. first. Right? All right. Correct. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, this is we had the teen leadership camp, which was for middle school kids. Uh, not too long ago uh in in december this one is in march it is for normally for high school juniors but because of covid and then last year the weather ryla has been canceled the last three years i believe um so they're actually opening it up to high school juniors and seniors so we will work to get at least two students maybe we can figure out a way to get more but uh sean casey and casey cox will be working on that and Steve, uh, that's March twenty second through uh, the twenty fourth. I'm so on. glad you're here, Ray. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. And and Steve, uh, we, the foundation is already paid, and so we just yes. need to get the kids. Absolutely. Um, and finally, Raymond, would you like to put the calendar up? Yes, sir. So tonight we have Brad Peterson. He's the number two guy. That's at the Satellite Rotary Club of Military Family Support, our satellite club. Brad Peterson is the number two guy in CalVet Loans. Anything you want to know about CalVet Loans, this guy knows. And I bet you didn't know that they're not just for houses uh, and how they can be assumed, how they can be transferred, all kinds of really cool information. Um, then, of course, you talked about the teacher mini grants coming up. Uh, our next big programs are Roads to Success. It's a woman with a program in the Middle East that does work in Jordan uh, and in Syria. And then we have one on March 6th which is uh, about uh, another program that works with Ukrainian children. And then we're signed up all the way through May. So we've got really good programs, both for the uh, our club and for the noon club and the satellite club. Okay, perfect. Well, folks, uh, thank you all for taking time today. I think it was a wonderful meeting, a conversation that needs to be had more. I uh, certainly learned a lot. Appreciate everybody being here. We do not have a meeting next week if I read the calendar correctly. Am I wrong about that? That's true. Next meeting is uh, teacher mini grants is the next event. And then the next meeting is February 7th. So we've got a little bit of a break. February 7th. So we got a couple weeks off. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the week. Wonderful West rest of the month. I'm glad the fine master wasn't here. I would have fined myself a lot of money for the Cowboys losing on Sunday. Um, <laughs> but I'm used to it by now. Uh, talk to you later, later, everybody. Have a great one.